or that most delectable endive poisoning was um, <laughs> some uh, some issues with with context. While it's a very convenient model, it's it's very slow to uh, execute. And we were looking at how um, costly the first level method lookup uh, cache uh, was. And I was telling you the story of um, Butler Lampson pointing out to Peter Deutsch that there was minimal polymorphism in, um, in small talk. Um, and that uh, this naturally led Peter to an optimization based around trying to map sends onto, uh, onto calls. So if we're going to map sends onto calls, the first thing we need to do is to um, eliminate contexts because you know native call instructions uh, on typical processes uh, imply a stack organization. They uh, push a return address on, 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 the, on the stack, etc. So to be able to use calls, and we'll see how calls speed up sends uh, soon, in order to uh, use calls for sends, the first thing we need to do is uh, eliminate uh, contexts and map activations down onto uh, stack frames. But it's not that simple because, as we've seen, contexts are uh, really nice things to have around. So what we need to do is to use a stack under the covers and make it appear to the Smalltalk programmer that contexts still exist. We have to support all of the, uh, the context machinery and semantics while implementing things in a very different way. So um, I'm in the simulator right now, and uh, these are frame pointers. So there are addresses in the, in the heap. Well, hang on. I, I, I will. I will hand wave. We will. We'll. We'll have a look. We'll have a look. Come on. You've. You've all. You've all seen stack traces. This looks just like the debugger. Just stick with me. It's. It's. It's going to get. It's going to get better. <laughs> so down the down the bottom. And basically, I don't because I don't have uh, web connectivity right now. Um, and that's some DNS issue with with uh, with the Mac. So maybe tomorrow I'll 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 get it set up for tomorrow. But right now we'll just have to live with it. So this is kind of the the the, the start of execution, uh, having uh, loaded a snapshot. And the system is uh, processing the the startup list. And what it does is is send a startup to each of the the classes in the in the startup list. And here's the first one, uh, input sensor, that's being sent uh, startup, colon. And uh, what does it do? It installs its uh, keyboard decoding uh, table. Um, and to do that, it needs to create some associations. Uh, so how does this uh, organization look? Uh, at the at the stack level, so no, that's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to do this. Sorry, that's right. Here we go. I got lots of crap. Cool. Okay. So here, and uh, stacks grow down, we'll just have a look at the, at the top few frames. So this is the, the top frame. And um, this is the, the frame pointer. So imagine the machine frame pointer is actually pointing at, uh, at this word. And the stack pointer is, is pointing down here. And the, on, on top of the stack is, a, is a, an instruction pointer. So what I've got here is here's the, 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 the caller instruction pointer. This is the, the uh, return PC of the, of the call that created this frame, 
just like in a, a very ordinary um, language implementation like C. And uh, remember that this method is a uh, key value on association class. So it's creating, it's association key colon blah, value colon blah. It's creating an association. So the receiver, which is the highest thing in this stack frame, given that stacks are growing down, is class association. And then the first uh, argument is some array, and that's going to be the key. And the second argument is uh, some uh, array, and that's going to be the value. And then uh, we push those on the stack, and we sent a key value. And in some way that we'll see in more detail, that was mapped onto a call instruction. So there was uh, the pushing of a return address, and then uh, the uh, frame building code instead of creating a new context is just building up this more conventional frame organization and it's going to push the old frame pointer that's okay you can go across that's right um, and then we 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 push the uh, the method and um, now you can see some support for maintaining context is that there's this field called uh, context but it's nil because this uh, this frame doesn't have a context associated with it yet um, and then uh, there's the outgoing local stack and here we have um, a receiver and we've got uh, a copy of the of the receiver so if I go up, look at this address. So this address, uh, um, if I if I delete this thing in between, we'll now see what what the stack was. That in the in the caller frame, when when this method, which is dictionary at put, wanted to create uh, an association, it pushed class association and uh, the two things that it wanted to to create the association out of, and then it did the send. And um, the, the way that we discover what its top of stack is, is implicitly. Uh, we know that this is the, the, the saved frame pointer, and that um, effectively the, um, the stack goes back num args plus one, num, the, the number of arguments plus the receiver, plus one for the call instruction pointer right that's 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 what we have beneath the frame pointer above the frame pointer sorry in every frame we've got a saved instruction pointer we've got the receiver and we've got however many arguments there are and then that's the that's the dividing line between the the sending frame so in the sending frame this one That's right. That's right. So, so when when this executes a return, it uh, you know restores the frame pointer, so that the frame pointer will now be this frame, right? One o one e forty. One o one e forty. Right, and then cut the stack pointer back by subtracting a number of arguments plus two, basically from the from the frame pointer. Right, and then and then continue. Um, so, but Stefan, do you see the relationship between this stack organization and stack organization in a language like C? Because I've got to fill in a lot more. So what what's actually happening in the in the VM is that we uh, are reserving a fixed size piece of memory, which we call the stack zone, which we're going to divide up 
into pages, and you can set the size of the stack zone at startup. And we actually stack allocate it on the on the C stack, and it, it would typically be uh, 64 pages, where each page has like 4K bytes, a, a, a thousand slots. Okay, and these are these are pages, and what we'll do is just arrange that when we execute Smalltalk, instead of creating contexts and running uh, in contexts on the heap and allocating context every time we, we create a message, we create a starting frame when we boot the VM, and then we do these call instructions to, to, to build new frames. And what we're going to do is um, uh, arrange that uh, we're going to do a, a check, a bounds check, whenever we, we build a frame to see whether we've, we're going to fall over the end of one of these pages, and then we're going to move to another page. And what that allows us to do is have um, a limited number of activations per page. So we can never have more than, say, 40 activations a page. And that means that uh, if we ever run out of pages, what I can do... Well, what the VM does is find the least recently used page, the oldest page, and write out those stack frames in the form of context to the heap. So all of their, they become exactly equivalent context, exactly like the context that you'd see in the old VM. Right? And now that page is vacant and can be used for execution. So you can think of it like a page cache. That's, that's, that's Peter Deutsch's terminology where uh, we kind of page in contexts into these stack pages into this more efficient form, okay, for the, for the most recent. Okay, so you, so you have the context, you have the structure that you, that's equivalent. Right, so when, so when we load the image, the image has only contexts in it, right? Yeah. And then the top context of, of the, in, in the image is converted into a frame, right? And what we, what we do is have a, a link that goes both ways, that, that, that the frame is married to the context. The context is married to the frame. And then when, when execution starts in the context of a frame, whenever that does ascend, it's going to create a new frame, or it's going to push stuff onto the stack in a, in a conventional way and, and, and execute like that. No, this, this, for example, you can do this with the interpreter. This is what the stack interpreter do, does. The JIT does this and the stack interpreter does this. That, that what, we, what we're doing at this level of the optimization is removing the overhead of creating a context and copying the arguments. Right? And so what, so what does that organization look like, look like? So this is what it looks like in terms of memory. Right? We, have, we have things growing down, right? and, and we can think of them as being organized in frames. And, and to build a new frame, uh, a caller frame is going to push some receiver and arguments, and then it's going to execute a send, and that send method is going to complete building the frame by pushing the, the saved frame pointer and initializing arguments, and you're going to end up with this kind of organization. Okay? So this is just very, very similar to what you'd see in a C program. Right? This, this, this is really no different. The only thing that's different here is this context field. Right. So how can we, um, you know, this has given us major efficiencies. We now have no allocation of a context object when we do a send, right? And we have no copying of arguments. But we still have to uh, present contexts to the rest of the system. The debugger expects contexts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So how do we um, manufacture contexts in this, in this context, in, in this context? Uh, Situation. God. I told you I was going to fall flat on my face. Um, so what, um, what we can do is uh, basically use encapsulation. So the points in the virtual machine where contexts are accessed are very few. So there are um, uh, primitives um, on context like at and at put that are special versions for, for, for contexts. Then there's um, the instance variable access primitives, inst var at and inst var at put. And then there's um, accessing an instance variable. So 
you know, the, the, the places in the virtual machine where we could possibly get at a context are kind of limited. So what we do is, is, is uh, a horrible hack to make it even more limited that um, whenever the virtual machine, uh, sorry, we modify the bytecode compiler And um, let me choose something. Uh, it's far refs. Let's look at this. There we go. Here's a nice one. So here's a method that, um, no, I don't want to look at that one. Let's look at this one. Yep. Okay, so here's um, here's a method that, fetches closure or nil and stack p and assigns sender. So if I have a look at those bytecodes, um, you'll see that the bytecode used to access um, closure or nil, which is the, the fifth instance variable, so it's got index four in a zero relative thing, is a humongous great big three byte code byte code three byte byte code it's not the normal push the fourth instance variable of, of the of the receiver that 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 would be just byte code four a single byte code instead it's using this 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 long uh, form and for all instance variables of context and and its superclass it's using this uh, this long form so what's happening uh, here is We've modified the bytecode compiler to not use the short forms for accessing instance variables of contexts. So we don't have to check for accessing a context on normal bytecodes. Normal instance variable bytecodes, we know that they can't be accessing a context because we've modified the bytecode compiler to only access instance variables of contexts using these long bytecodes. Okay. So if I if I if I access y of a point if I if I find um, if I find class point and I find like like um, say this guy here where you know we when we push x. We just use bytecode zero, and when we, we push um, y, we just use bytecode one. These are these are one byte long bytecodes, and we certainly don't want to, on every instance variable access, try and fetch the class of the object and say is it a context, and we have to do something special. Instead, what we do is we we just do it on these um, long form bytecodes. So in the bytecode set to save space there are um, 16 bytecodes which fetch the first 16 slots of an object. But then there's an extended one because we've got objects that are much larger than 16 slots. And uh, there's a, um, a humongous bytecode called the double extended do anything bytecode. And indeed, it can do an awful lot. But one of the things that it can do is fetch an instance variable. And so in this case, we check just this one bytecode. And in fact, um, because this bytecode is designed for accessing beyond 16, right? we actually don't have to check um, on, on every um, access. All we do is check if this long bytecode is being used to access an instance variable other than, uh, we only use it if on, the, on the first three variables, which is the sender of a context, the program counter, and the stack pointer. And everything else is, is unchecked. So this actually turns out to be really cheap because at this point we've got the field index that we're going to access, and all we're doing is comparing against a contact, uh, a constant in the machine code. So very, very, very quick. 
So the places where I have to uh, check for um, accessing a context are this one bytecode and the instvar at and instvar at put primitives and the special versions of at and at put on contexts. Insvar, in, you know what insvar at is? You've, you've seen insvar at and insvar at put. So um, let's find shallow copy, right? Remember the old implementation of shallow copy? Index becomes equal to class int size. Index greater than or equal to, uh, greater than zero while true. New object insvar at index put self insvar at. Right, insvar at and insvar at put are the, are the encapsulation defying primitives that just access named instance variables by index. Right, so the only places in the system, in this system with this compiler, that the inside of a context object can be accessed is the double extended do anything bytecode and those, those primitives. So on most instance variable access, the virtual machine doesn't have to do anything. Yeah, right. Okay. Right, exactly. So the, the, the problem is that there's only one copy of that primitive, right? Right. It was, it was, and 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 that object looked like any other object. Oh, I so, think it was created only on demand, only when I was using the variable. No, no. So it's implicit. So when um, when uh, you make a send and you need a new context, a context is created. If you want to name that context, you then mention this context, okay. right? So the, the, so the object is always created. Except, except when your send uh, executes just a primitive, right? I mean, the, the primitive can run in the stack frame of, of the okay. of the context that sent the primitive. But lazily create the context, right? Okay. Right. Right. No, this is almost exactly the same as visual works. This is yeah. Right, right. The, the 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 blog post. So I need I need to to, to give better uh, rationale in the first place. So, um, because the virtual machine is so well organized, uh, that encapsulation is, is 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 very easy, and we arrange that only um, in 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 those three cases the special primitives on context, which I can I can show you. So there are special versions of, of of at and at put which have their own primitive number, which differ from the ones up in in object, which are sixty one and sixty two. And um, there's already a, a a a primitive for accessing the um, the stack pointer of a context, and here's a, another one for accessing its basic size. Yeah, I, 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 I could have, I could have, I, I, I could have, but it's to do with the, the way that the instvar at primitive was, was written, because it already had to do special things, so I, 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 I didn't need to. Um, so let's, uh, uh, I don't want to drag you through the details, 
I, I do want to drag you through a bit of the details. I do, I do want to drag you through the but, but So the, 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 the trick is, of course, if we send a message to a context, um, if that object is just a normal context, we can just return whatever the value is. But if that context is, is uh, associated with a frame, we can compute the value of the instance variable from the, from the frame, if we can get from the context to the frame. So let me show you what, uh, what that looks like. Sorry? No, we do need to create the context because um, the only thing that Smalltalk can compute with is Smalltalk objects. There is no way in which you can mention a frame in Smalltalk, right? I mean, how would we, how would we represent the frame? You do have to create something that receives the message. So you might as well create something that's the right size and having to do a become, very expensive become later on, right? So you, you, you create a context, but you don't bother to fill it, fill it in fully, okay? That's a great, that's a great point. So, okay, here's, here's, a, here's a kind of thing. Uh, here's what they look like. So um, what, what we need to do, um, first of all, is have a way of relating a context to a frame. So let me go back to my uh, um, my transcript. Where is my transcript? I can't. I can never read these things. In um, keep on. Just tell tell me when to stop. It's the bottom transcript. Thank you. Cool. So what we can do is, um, in the frame, it's easy. We have a slot which refers to the context object. In a context object, it's more difficult. We know that the sender field of a context is either another context or nil. It certainly can never be a small integer. Right? So what, what we do is just use um, small, uh, a small integer in the sender field as meaning that this is not a real context. This is actually a proxy for a frame. And the small integer that we use is its frame pointer with the, with the tag bit set. So if a context has a, a small integer in its sender field, it's not a normal context. So then um, the, uh, the computation can just say, OK, is it, uh, is it uh, one of these? Uh, what we call married, because it's married to a frame. And uh, if it is, we will compute the value of the instance variable from the frame. So here, for example, uh, if you're asking for the sender, what we're doing is we have a context, and it's associated with a frame, and that frame may have a, a, a frame ab above it that, that called it that may not have a context. So we have to associate a context with that frame. So at that point, we would have to create a context for the frame above it. Of course, you, you know that we've got these stack pages. The bottom frame on each uh, page has to be connected in some way, either to another page or to contexts. So the bottommost frame on a page will have a context anyway. And so um, answering the context of the bottommost frame on a page is easy. It's only these intermediate frames that we may have to create a new, a new object. And then, of course, if it's the if it's the stack pointer, then we have to to, to figure out what the stack pointer index for a frame is, and and so that means okay, where's where's the where's the uh, where's the top of stack of the next frame and stuff like that. And we might have to actually have to walk down a stack page a, 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 a set of frames to find out where the the caller frame is. If you ask, you know, if you ask for for what's the stack pointer of this guy in the middle of the stack. The only way I can find its stack is by starting off at the top of the page and, and, and walking back until I hit it. But it's all just, you know, it's all just walking pointers and finding out where, where the bounds are and computing it. And then, of course, the instruction pointer. Well, the instruction pointer uh, frames will have uh, their saved return address. And so I have to find those. Right? 
So basically, I can, uh, by walking these frames in, in the same way that a machine debugger would walk C frames in GDB and stuff, I can find all of this information and I can answer the same results as if I was using a, a context. So then uh, there's an interesting uh, thing, which is how do we know that uh, a context is still associated with a frame? Because uh, you know frames can can can. Sorry. Yeah, the, the most interesting thing. Right, is right. Capturing the like holding the some context. For right. Example, uh, uh, an application doing non-local return. Right. What happens? To what happens with non-local return? So what what Igor was saying is is imagine we've got a a, a a a stack page and we've got lots of frames and we've created some contexts and we might have stored them. Right, for example, in Seaside, we might have taken a whole series of references. And then you do a non-local return here, which returns from all of those pages. What happens to those, to those contexts? They're, 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 um, in my terminology, they're widowed. Um, so in, um, in the VisualWorks VM, there was a horrible, um, clumsy attempt at keeping those two things consistent. And whenever the uh, a frame became married whenever a frame got a context the um, machine code that it was running would be changed so that the return instructions wouldn't be normal in return instructions they would instead be calls on a runtime that would write back the state of the frame into the context object so it made returns very slow but it kept the heap context up to date right and so there was all of this effort to write back state into the context object. Well, it's much easier to um, instead make these things lazy. So let me create a context. And um, let's have a look at it after it's returned. So here I've got a context. And um, it's, it's got two things on the stack. Um, and it's got a receiver. And it's got a method. And it's got a stack pointer. But its program counter is set to nil to indicate that it's been returned from. And its sender is set to nil to indicate it's been returned from. So, um, in fact, the only variables that we have to keep up to date are essentially um, the the stack point, uh, the, the the method, uh, and the receiver. And anything else can just be set to nil. So, if we have the bounds on uh, a stack page set, and we know what portion of a stack page is in use, okay then um, if when I look at the, the sender, when I look at the frame pointer of a context object, it lies outside of the used portion of a, of a page, I know that it's widowed, that its frame is gone, and I can change all of its instance variables to these default nil values after the fact. If it's within a page, I need to find out, is it actually valid? Is it a context for this frame? It might be a context for a frame that's long been written over by other returns and, and, uh, and, and sent. Well, if you have a look at this stack representation, what you see in this stack representation is um, there are either references to methods uh, in, the, in, the, in the method zone, the, the machine code zone, uh, in instruction pointer and, and, and method, or the objects. And uh, the method zone is disjoint from objects. So there's, um, there's no way that if I follow uh, a, a frame pointer and I find that the context field of a frame matches the context from which I'm, I'm asking the question. I start off with a context. I follow its frame pointer and say, is the context field this thing? Right? Because whenever we allocate a context, we allocate a unique object. 
and we never reuse these guys. If, when I ask that question, if I follow this, this, this frame pointer and I get to something whose frame has a back pointer to me, um, it's a match. It's actually more complicated than that. I also have to uh, have a fiducial, and, and there's another field in the context, which is I, I set the instruction pointer to, to be the frame pointer. And if those two things match, I know that I'm well aligned with respect to a frame, that I'm not looking halfway down a frame. Right? I, must, I, must be, I must be looking at the frame at the right point. I'm actually looking at the frame pointer field. And if the context is pointing back, it's a match. So what that means is that um, I don't have to do anything at return time. I can leave it uh, lazily. Lazily I can discover whether or not um, a context is referring to a live frame. Now I'm being really hand wavy here and there's much more careful treatment on the blog. All right? but, but that's the basic idea. So the basic idea is uh, the context object is a, is, a, is a proxy for a frame and uh, you can find out by looking at the state of the stack uh, when you follow this, this uh, embedded frame pointer whether or not this context has been returned from or is still live. And if it's returned from, you can just default all of its values. Um, one of the things that I uh, glossed over here was that um, when we looked at A and B, they were nil. And um, I don't. I, there's, there's a very detailed discussion on the on the on the on the blog with that. But basically, we didn't do anything in this in this uh, in. Um, if it had arguments, if this thing had had ah oh, yes, sorry. Let me let me do that instead. It's not important. If it had arguments, it would have preserved the arguments. It doesn't bother to preserve the values of the temporary variables. The temporary variables are di are, are lost when you uh, when you return from the context. But the arguments would have been preserved. So now what I've done is I've, um, I've got context objects as proxies for stack frames. And I can compute the state of context instance variables from the frame. But what do I do if I want to set instance variables of a context? How do I implement you change the sender of a context so that it refer returns to somewhere else? How do I um, implement... Uh, assigning to the instruction pointer so that we do a jump? How do I um, you know, uh, start simulating execution when, where, where if I'm using interpret next method, I'm doing pushes and pops? One simple way to do that is uh, to write out the, the frame and destroy the frame and to, to refresh the heap context. It's just write all of the state out from the frame into the context. So that's a problem if it's the middle frame in a page, right? because these, these, these frames only make sense if they're contiguous. There's no support for having a hole. So if I wanted to write something out in the middle, what I have to have is a primitive which splits a page into two. And so the, the, the basic primitive that you need is take some number of frames from this page and put them on another page, on an empty page. And then any number of intervening frames can be destroyed. Right? So let's say I've got three frames on this page, right? and the rest of my stack zone is full. And I want to assign to this middle one. Right? First of all, I have to find a vacant page to move this one to. And so I find the least recently used page, and I evacuate it, writing all of those contexts to the heap all of those frames to the heap as context. And now I have an empty page, right? And then I, I move this state to that page, and I change its frame pointer. And if it had a context, I make sure that I change that context frame pointer, right? And then I write this guy back to the heap as a context and say bye-bye to him, and I'm left. So I've split this page into two, OK? So with that, I can uh, change the sender field of, of any frame, right? Because if I want to change this one to, 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 to return to any other context, uh, be it a frame, then I cut those two, I, I cut that page at that point and make that, that the, 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 the guy that I've changed its sender the bottommost frame on a page. It's very expensive. It's much, much more expensive than, um, than sending changing the sender of a context. 
the first time. The next time you do it, it's already on the bottom of a page, and bottommost pages have a field, and it's quick. So the first time, it's very expensive. And in fact, you, you know, if you're going to move 20 frames, it could take, take you know, hundreds of times longer than it takes to set the field of a, of a or maybe even thousands, than it takes to set the field of a, of a, uh, a context. And so if you run um, uh, coroutining uh, code in COG, you'll find that it goes much slower than in the old interpreter. But we win so much from this basic optimization that we gain it all back and that overall, you know, the system is faster. And even if you're using heavy coroutining, you have to be really doing benchmarking to, to, to lose because usually the amount of, of, of backtracking code in, in an application is going to be relatively small and this is going to win big in all of the other areas. But what's nice is that there's just one primitive to be able to do all of this manipulation, even though you'd think that we had this really in, inflexible representation underneath it all. So that's the, that's the, the, the basic way that we uh, now have a stack organization and preserve contexts. Uh, if you don't ask, I'll ramble on until you fall asleep. Please, and don't, don't, please just butt in. Please just say, just shout it out. Oh, yeah. uh, so, this, this uh, page is uh, different, are not uh, stored in the same place where the VM puts the normal object. They're in that's right, that's right. They're, they're in a separate thing. And, and what, I, what I do is, uh, and for an interesting reason, when the virtual machine starts up, it stack allocates in the C sense of stack allocating the memory for the, uh, the stack because there are thread systems where the way that you find out what thread you're in is by uh, taking the native stack pointer modulo some number. And so each thread is given its own piece of native stack and the stack pointer is actually the, the thread ID. So on certain implementations of Linux, you have to use the, the native C stack for things like pthread kill and all of that kind of stuff to, to, to work. So what happens is that there's a field in the image, which is the number of stack pages to allocate. And, and there's a primitive to change that. And then at startup, it just allocates that much memory. Sorry? From the HTTP point of view? No, these guys do exist. These guys do exist because they, are, they, they contain references to objects. Uh, and they have to be scanned. For the method, these are roots. These are roots. The, the, context, the, the contents of a stack frame, if the stack frame is live, must not be garbage collected. So the garbage collector does traverse all of these. And you'll find some horrendously big... Uh, uh, garbage collection routines that, 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 that scan the stack. And then you should see moves around the context so that you need to update the pointer. Right, the, exactly, exactly, uh, okay. exactly. So there's, you know, there's like, you know, three or four pages of code, which is all to do with walking these, 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 these stack frames. And in fact, let me, let me, let me scare you, show you the kind of, of, of madness. Um, Mark and trace stack pages, right, says, okay, make sure that I, I write back the frame pointer so that I know the valid portion of the active page, and then from zero to the number of stack pages minus one, uh, uh, set some, some usage flag on it that says that the page, we don't know whether the page is used yet. And then... Um, uh, if we're doing a uh, not doing a full GC mark and trace stack page kind of thing, so here's what mark and trace uh, stack page looks like. So you start off at the the head, the stack pointer and the frame pointer of the head frame, um, and then uh, if it's not the active page, there'll be an instruction pointer on the top of it, and you want you don't want to look at that because that's machine code. And then here we are, kind of walking through all of the arguments. 
of uh, sorry the temporaries of a, of a stack and then uh, here uh, we're saying do we have a context etc and then here we're, we're this is walking the, the frame pointer and so on so there's a horribly uh, messy piece of crap that does indeed walk, walk the stack and, and update all of those kind of things Well, I mean, I think the the problem here, Igor, is slang. Yeah. Right? It's not it's not these algorithms. It's it it, it it's slang. And you, you've seen Gerard de Richarte and and Javier Baroni's presentation on their VM. Well, we we can talk about that 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 tomorrow. But imagine um, writing a small talk VM. Now let's talk about it now. So. <laughs> You, you know, this, this is not really small talk. Uh, the, the richest control structure we've got is, is two by do. We have while true and two by do, and, that, and that's it. We have to, to build everything by it because this stuff is converted by a very naive program into C. There's no dictionaries. There's no sets. There's no do. There's no blocks. This is a very denuded form of small talk. And we have to pepper it with all of this crap, this type information, which um, uh, informs the, um, the translator so that we can produce C code that looks like, um, looks like this. So, um, yeah, it's it 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 it's it's vile. So um, here you go. Here's mark and trace stack page, and all of this type information here has been generated from this uh, this meta information here. Um, and so the, the only way that we get away with doing this is by writing the VM in, in non-small talk, is, is, is writing in, in, in some C. So what um, Gerardo Ricciati and, and Javier Baroni did, and it's, it's really fun, is, is they like to uh, break software. And the way that they break software is by very, very carefully annotating the machine code for the software. And they love small talk. And they use Smalltalk to develop attacks, security attacks, which they then sell to people who want their programs to be attacked to, to check that their programs are, will not break in the field. So they're using dynamic languages to, to, to uh, improve security. Um, and they have a very well-defined process in uh, trying to, to break uh, uh, software. Um, what they do is they write Smalltalk code that, that, that produces the machine code that they're interested in attacking. And that small talk serves as, as a, a, a specification of the machine code that's, that's produced. And they, um, because they love small talk, they decided to try and break VSE. They broke Visual Works. Visual Works was very easy to break. And then they decided to break VSE. And so they would compile, they would uh, figure out what each bytecode did by creating some fake method which contained just the bytecode and pushing it through the um, the JIT and in a machine level debugger finding out the machine code and then in another image writing a method that would produce exactly that machine code as the specification and so once they've done that they know exactly the machine code that everything produces every bytecode produces and they have this nice readable declarative form that they can understand sorry and so they, they, they reverse engineer it and, and then by, by reading that small talk, they're able to, to, to think about, conceptualize how to attack it. But they realized that what they'd done after they, they, they documented the visual, uh, the, the visual age, the, sorry, the, uh, the, the VSE JIT, is that they'd implemented a JIT in small talk. 
So that's what they had now. They had a they had a JIT and Smalltalk, right? Here's, here's, the, here's the, the Smalltalk method that will JIT this bytecode. Here's the Smalltalk method that will JIT that bytecode. So how do you use that to produce a VM? So what they did is spend four months writing a, an exporter that will take machine code and generate a portable executable, a Windows portable executable DLL. And so what they do is they just apply the JIT to itself in Smalltalk. And now they have machine code in a byte array. And they use their, their exporter. And now they have a DLL with the, with the JIT written in itself. Okay? So you need to figure out what the closed world is. right? You need to say, how much of the class library am I using? And right now, they, they, they just have a list. They just you know, try and punch it out. And, and, and there'll be some dangling pointer. And then they'll include something. You know? So they have this list of what the clo closed world is. And so they can generate the, uh, the DLL. And then how do, you, how do you run the DLL? Well, loading the DLL is easy. Windows does that for you. But how do you replace the VM that you're running? So you just find all of the addresses of the routines in the normal VM and replace the first instruction with a call, a jump to the, to the corresponding thing in the, in the DLL. So now what you can do is you can write your small, small, VM in pure small talk. You can apply it to itself. You can write it out as a DLL. You can load that DLL and replace the, the VM. Now, they haven't done that step, but they have replaced the garbage collector. They've rewritten the VSE garbage collector in Smalltalk, and they've pushed it out to a DLL, and they've replaced it in a running VSE. And so that means this is obsolete crap. This is horrible, and that's the way to do it. And so, you know, next thing is to try and get some funding to do that. It's a very, very beautiful idea. Uh, it's fabulous. Um, there's certain things uh, which VSE uh, does in the VM, which make it very easy in that um, the way that they handle polymorphism is, is by basically having a class word in front of each method for each class that can use it. It's like uh, the way that you do polymorphic inline caches is by basically having, having the classes for which a method is valid at the start of a method. So there's kind of less dynamism going on uh, in, in VSE. So there would be more interest in, in you know, there's, there's some things that which are not uh, fully sorted out uh, in, in, to do it with COG. But basically, uh, the idea is, is, is brilliant, and um, I can't wait to do it. And then uh, you would uh, um, write these algorithms in as high level as you wanted, arranging that you would effectively uh, bound the amount of memory that you were going to use because you would create objects right to represent these things right so what you'd need is something like a uh, an arena where you could allocate objects which would be uh, discarded just like stack allocation where you discard the results after each basic operation of the vm like jitting or running a garbage collection right so running a garbage collection is going to involve creating a whole series of objects in your virtual machine. And you have to be able to, to understand your design well enough to know exactly how much memory yeah. you're going to create. And then you just throw, throw those things away. Can they avoid that? I mean, can you explain Maybe. In some, in some uh, using small talk, since I'm still using small talk, feedback, but express all these operations with large CPU. May, may, maybe, but um, I think you, uh, instead you come up with these kind of proxy objects that look like I have a class and I have an address and I have some methods, right? And I am a stack frame and I am a method, you know, a, a piece of machine code method and I am an object, right? And so they're, 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 they're very simple objects and they're largely methods, but, but they're basically some way of embedding an, an address of saying, I want to associate this piece of small talk behavior with this machine word. Right? Because this machine word might be the header of an object. It might be some machine code. It might be a, a stack frame. Right? But um, you know, those, are, those are the questions you ought to ask yourself in trying to write one of these. Right? You should try and write one of these in, in, in this style and see how far you get. Because I'm sure that these, these, you know, these are going to be exactly the research questions which are going to be the most fun to, to answer. Um, I think it's, you know, 
It's really exciting, really exciting. And, and everybody should see that, um, that presentation by Javier and, and, uh, and Ruth Sharte. And it's at the end of, of my post on inline caching. So you can, you can find it there. But it's basically at the, at the Small Talks 2010 thing. Anyway, back to this boring, obsolete crap that we're looking at. Um, so right, so um, we've got we've got um, now under the covers we have a stack organization. We can do everything that we could do with context. Some of the things are slow, but most of the things uh, are much much faster. And uh, send now looks like a call. So how do we uh, profit from uh, a call? That ability to to uh, to, to do. Uh, sends as calls uh, to make sends go fast. And this is just inline caching. So uh, let's have a look at what an inline cache looks like. So I have to close some windows. And now I can just do this, right. So what I'm going to do is run the simulator um, breaking whenever I see a send of, of basic new. And the reason I want to do that is uh, I want to look at the, uh, the new method. Message names. So here's the uh, behavior new method. So what does behavior new do, do, do? It uses basic new to allocate an uninitialized instance, and then it sends initialize, and then it returns that, that result. So this is implemented in behavior and is um, inherited by every class in the in the system, uh, and so um, only only classes that are going to override new are not going to uh, pick this up. So the bulk of classes um, do use this. So uh, when this send of basic new is going to happen, what's going to happen is um, it's going to get sent to a lot of different classes, and it's going to become very very polymorphic very, very quickly. Right? And we're going to send initialize to new instances of all sorts of classes. So this is going to get polymorphic uh, very quickly, too. So let's uh, run this. And right now we're in the interpreter, and now we're not. So, oh, sorry, this screen, not having the big screen is a real pain. Um, so, um, we are in the context of a frame here, and um, is that right? I'm not sure. I'm not sure I believe that. Hang on. We're doing a send. What's that? Let me type it in, and then I'll believe it. Yeah, we are. We are we're sending basic new. Ah, that's right. That's right. We're sending basic new. Okay. Well, that'll 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 still do. So what we're doing now is having a look at um, uh, apologies. We 
we're having a look at this method, which says self basic new key colon value colon. So let's have a look at this. Um, it's a very simple method. It's got seven byte codes, six byte codes. Uh, push the receiver, which is uh, going to be uh, the association class or a subclass, send basic new, and then uh, push the, the two arguments and send key value to assign them and then, and then return the top. So when the, when the JIT uh, produces machine code for this, it produces uh, some, in this case, x86 machine code, which has got all sorts of things going on, like there's a, there's a header which says um, you know, how big this chunk of machine code is and what, what method it's associated with, et cetera, et cetera. And there's some uh, code that we're going to look at in some detail later on, which is uh, a, a checking code. And then there's uh, code here which builds the frame. So here we are pushing the, the, fr the old frame pointer to establish the, the frame pointer of the, of the new frame, copying the stack pointer to the frame pointer, um, pushing the method object, uh, and in initializing some local temporaries. So this, this code is, is, the, is the code that builds a frame. And this code here is, um, is checking, are we at the end of a stack page, which is used also for checking for events. So that's, that's uh, if we've built a frame, have we gone too far? Do we, do we need to, to spill over onto another page? But finally, here we are uh, in code that is executing small talk. So this is the code that sends basic new. So what's happening here is that we're grabbing the, uh, the receiver and uh, we're pushing it on the stack. So this, this grabs the receiver from uh, the right offset in the frame uh, and, uh, and pushes it. And there's nothing particularly clever about this, this code generator. This is a particularly naive code generator. And this copies the... Um, the value we've just pushed, which is going to be the receiver of this message, into a register. So we've got a register, EDX, which is holding on to the receiver. And that's very important. We have the receiver in a register. And then I implement the, the send. This is, this is very classical inline cache stuff that, that Peter Deutsch invented. Implement the send as two instructions. One is um, going to become a cache tag. It's going to become the thing that tells us whether a message lookup at this particular point is valid or not. But right now, and, and that cache tag is going to be implemented as a value that we're going to represent as a, a constant load into a register. So the value of the tag is the constant loaded. And to make it convenient, we're going to put it in a register so that we can manipulate the value in the register. And then we're going to call somewhere. But before we've, we've, um, we've executed this, in its null state, the cache tag is the selector that we want to send. So it's not a cache tag at this point. It's just the selector that we're trying to send. And we're going to call a runtime routine whose job it is to perform the send. So in this case, uh, basic new has zero arguments. And so we're going to call this routine called uh, CE send zero arguments. And what, what this routine is going to do is, is, is use the, the, the receiver that's in a register, EDX, and the selector that's in a register, ECX. And it's going to do a lookup. And when it does that lookup, it's going to find some method which may have been translated into machine code by the, by the JIT. And so if it, if it manages to find a machine code uh, method that is the implementation of, of basic new that's been converted to machine code, just like this is an implementation of uh, Q, 
key value that's been converted to machine code from that byte-coded form. If we can, um, let me. If we can uh, um, find that machine code, we're going to replace this call of the runtime routine, which is doing something very much like what the interpreter does on every send, with a direct call of, of the machine code form. So what I want to do is uh, cogit single step true and break PC. Okay. So, so now we um, let the thing let the thing run. Um, and let me have a look what the machine code has become. And I want to remember this old machine code and show you it next next to it. So And if I, if I had my big screen, all of this would be on menu picks instead of me typing in the do-its, but I can't find the, the menu, so I, I apologize. This is really tedious, but never mind. So let's have a look at that uh, old uh, original machine code uh, here, 8B8E. And uh, what's uh, happened is it's been replaced by this machine code. And so we write, rewrite the machine code in place. And instead of loading ECX with the, um, the selector, we're now loading it with the class of the receiver. So the class of the receiver, when we first executed this, was association class, because we sent key value to association. Sorry, we sent basic new to association. And we're calling the basic new method at a particular offset. And we're calling it at the, uh, at the, the entry checking offset. So what happened was that we uh, sent the message to a particular uh, uh, instance that was an instance of a particular class and found a, a, a valid target. And we modified the send site to call that target having loaded a register with the class. So basically, if we ever execute this again, and the current class of the receiver is the same as that class, we are sending the same message to an instance of the same class, and it's OK. It's only if we send the message to an instance of a different class that this may be invalid. Who understands that? So. No, hang on. Lots of people don't get it. You, 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 lots of people get it, but it's not easy. It's not obvious. So what a method lookup cache does, the first level method lookup cache does, which I think you understood, right, is it says we can uh, memoize these lookups that we do by walking the class hierarchy, right? I mean, notionally, what do we do when we look up a message in Smalltalk? Grab this object, grab a selector, Grab this object's class, fetch its method dictionary, search its method dictionary for the selector. If we find it, we're done. Otherwise, follow the superclass link until we find a match. Right? Incredibly slow process. So we shortcut that by having this first level method lookup cache. And what we do is we create a hash function of the class and the selector and look at that hash function in this table and find out, is there a pair which says this class and this selector? And if we find that, the method is valid, right? We all understand that, right? Yeah? Cool. So what's happening here is 
this is a particular send site in machine code that corresponds to a particular selector. This, the, you know, this, this location in machine code can only be executing basic new. It's not like the method lookup cache in the interpreter where every send is, 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 is looking at that method lookup cache, right? This is a particular place, and implicit in this place in the program is that we're using a particular selector, right? Just like you know, implicit in the byte-coded method, you know, the third bytecode in, in, in the new method, it, it sends basic new, right? We don't, we don't have to check the selector, it's implicit. That send site can only send that selector. So the only thing we're interested in is what's the class? So the first time we execute it, right, we grab the class of the first receiver, what was the, the receiver on the first execution, right? And we find the target method and we find the target method in machine code, and we call it. So the next time, if we call this method, and that method can say, ah, the class of the receiver is the same as it was when I was linked, it's fine. Right? And remember what, what Butler Lamson said. He said that there's no polymorphism in Smalltalk programs. It's all, it's all in your imagination, all in your head. It's the same class every time. And if that's true, what we have to do is find out as quickly as possible, has the class changed? And if the class hasn't changed, it's fine. So where did we record the class? We recorded the class at the send site in the form of a register load. Right? Instead of loading the register with the selector, we now load it with the class. So at the send site, this register contains the class for which that target method is valid. Right. So what the entry code has to do is find the class of the current receiver and compare that against the register. And if those two are the same, we're just sending the same message to an instance of the same class, and we've got to the right place, and there's nothing more to do. Right? If they don't match, we're in the same old hell. We have to go and look everything up. Right? Okay. So, what does the entry code do? What the entry code does is use the fact that we also loaded another register with the receiver. EDX has got the, the receiver in it. And it goes through that horrible class fetch thing. Here it is testing, where it copies EDX to a, a temporary register, EAX, and it ands it with the tag bit for small integers. Okay. Okay, so we do a clever thing here. I invented this. I'm really pleased. Uh, we don't then go and find the class small integer. All we need is tags that are unique. So for each class in the system, we have to have a unique tag. So a unique tag for small integers is the small integer tag. The only, the only class in the system that has small integer tags a small integer. No, no, all, all of the other objects are not tagged, right? So if the inline cache contains the small integer tag, that's just as good as saying it's class small integer. It's way cheaper than, than going to the special objects array right, and, and, and trying to fish the actual object out. Right? And then we can do the same thing with the compact class index. So here we are um, anding uh, uh, the header word of the object. Here, here we fetch the header word of the object and shift it and and it with this um, uh, five bit field, which is the compact class index. So if the object is an instance of a compact class, the compact class field is fine as a tag, providing it can't be uh, it can't be confused with the small integer tag. So it has to be shifted with respect to the small integer tag, and it has to be shifted with respect to the heap. It can't be up somewhere in the heap, right? So all it's got to do is, 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 is be at a nice low position, like, like from, from 0 to, to 128. I mean, it's from, from whatever it is. So the forms that, that, that these uh, inline cache tags can take is it's either the, the tag pattern for an immediate, or it's the compact class pattern, or it's the class object. And here we are, down here, actually fetching the class object. So this uh, messy piece of machine code, what it does is get into EAX the uh, effectively the class of the receiver 
but it's actually the, the class tag. It would be a small integer tag for a small integer. It would be the, the compact class index for an instance of a compact class, or it would be the class. And if, if that value is the same as the value we loaded at the register, uh, at the send site, the, the value that's in ECX, we have sent the same message to an instance of the same class, and we can continue execution. If it, if it, if it isn't, then we have to jump and do some horrible abort. So 90% of sends in Smalltalk programs behave exactly like this. And so this was the big thing in 1984 that, that Peter Deutsch did that, that made running Smalltalk on conventional hardware possible. You could run Smalltalk on a, a, a 68010, and it would go almost as fast as a Dorado. And suddenly, we could have Smalltalk on, um, on workstations. The problem was what to do when it misses, the 10% of send sites that miss. And so what Peter did, being a very clever man, was produce machine code that without going into to the runtime, whatever, actual generated machine code that would, um, in this method abort guy, would do a first level method lookup cache probe with the current class of the receiver. So we've got a different class. Look it up. Most of the time it binds to the same thing. Right, most of the you know all all most of the classes in 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 the in the in the class hierarchy uh, bind to the same basic new method or the same new method. Right, so most of the time when you when you rebind, you get to the same place. He wrote machine code that would update the send site uh, to reflect the new receiver, and if you profile that, you know all, all of your time has gone away from the first level method lookup uh, cache probe that the interpreter was d was doing into this rebinding of the send site. So rebound it. I was wait. I, 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 I'm trying to connect that to what I thought uh, that we were not yet with the uh, eight. No, 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 we're getting there. We're getting there. That that comes next. I just wanted to give you the the the, the, the history. Okay. Right. Right. So. So rebinding the send site is a really slow thing, and you've optimized sends, and if you profile now, you find that all of the time that you've saved in sends is now going into rebinding send sites. So then the self guys in 93 uh, came up with the idea of let's not rebind the send site. Let's instead, for this small percentage, this 10%, let's uh, convert the thing into a jump table. And we'll try and implement a jump table where we'll say, OK, if, if the class is, is, is this, we'll choose that method. And if the class is something else, we'll choose that method, and so on and so on. Um, and it makes sense to uh, have a, 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 a fixed size table, because we don't know how many cases we're going to be. Um, and in most, most cases, the degree of polymorphism is, uh, is small. So I'm going to let this guy um, run. That is what a polymorphic that, that, that is what a polymorphic line, inline cache is is, is called. So um, Sorry. What is going on? Yeah, and in fact, I, 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 I'm, I'm dying to go to the loo. So, um, I'll see you later. <laughs>